There are legends whose stories, like whispers carried on the winds of remembrance, continue to stir the hearts and captivate the minds of all who dare to listen. One such legend, a name engraved in the collective consciousness, is none other than the indomitable Mad Dog Shriver. They say that the spirit of heroes never truly dies, that it lingers on, waiting for the perfect moment to resurface and ignite the flames of inspiration once more. Perhaps, just perhaps, the time will come when the world bears witness to the return of Mad Dog Shriver. Get ready as we uncover the adventure of this warrior. More a warrior than a soldier. Who is MSG Jerry Mad Dog Shriver? Now this guy wasn't your ordinary soldier. He was a full-on warrior, dedicated to the art of warfare and all things violent. He embodied the raw, primal essence of war itself. He was the kind of guy you wanted on your side, but heaven help you if you find yourself facing him as an enemy. Those who fought alongside Shriver could spin tales about him like no other. Just ask Medal of Honor recipient Jim Fleming, who described Shriver as the ultimate warrior loner. He was antisocial, completely consumed by his craft and the absolute best teammate you could have. Training? That was his life. He was always pushing himself, constantly honing his skills. Shriver was so formidable that Fleming once declared, Thanks to Shriver, I've sworn off crossing paths with strangers in bars for the rest of my life. Now that's the kind of impact this guy had. Mad Dog Shriver served in the United States Army as a Green Beret, and he was no stranger to the battlefield. He fought in the Vietnam War, taking part in operations along the treacherous Ho Chi Minh Trail, as well as in Cambodia and Laos from 1966 to 1969. He even had stints in West Germany and Taiwan, adding to his impressive resume. His peers hailed him as a true warrior, and he earned numerous medals and awards for his fearless and effective service. He was a force to be reckoned with, especially in those top-secret special operations missions in North and South Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. Brief Tales from History Jerry Shriver, the man of mystery, seemed to pop up out of nowhere, leaving us scratching our heads and wondering where he came from. Born on September 24, 1941, in Defuniac Springs, Florida, Shriver's early life remains shrouded in secrecy. We've dug around, and here's what we've uncovered so far. Now, it's clear that Shriver had a taste for adventure from an early age. He attended airborne school and had a brief stint with the 101st. But here's the kicker. He achieved the prestigious Green Beret status at a ridiculously young age. He was really an overachiever, and just when we thought we had him figured out, he vanished from the pages of history once again. Let's dive a little deeper into Shriver's background. He was born Jerry Michael Tate Shriver to his parents Dale Leroy Shriver and Dorothy Madeline Shriver. He grew up with three sisters and two brothers and their family eventually moved to Sacramento, California. It was there that Shriver made a life-changing decision. Inspired by his father's military service, including fighting in the Korean War and serving in the Philippines, Shriver decided to follow in his footsteps. At the tender age of 22, he enlisted in the army. Fast forward to 1966, and Shriver reappears on the military scene. This time, as a staff sergeant in the legendary Military Assistance Command, Vietnam Studies and Observations Group MACV SOG. What's MACV SOG, you ask? Well, it's an elite task force that specialized in top secret hush hush missions during the Vietnam War. These guys were the real deal, undertaking covert operations in the Southeast Asian theater. During his time in Vietnam, Shriver earned himself the nickname Mad Dog. But get this, it wasn't his buddies who gave him that moniker, it was his enemies. Yep, you heard it right. The NVA propaganda machine, Radio Hanoi, even went so far as to announce a hefty $10,000 bounty on his head. Adjusted for inflation, that's roughly $70,000 in today's dollars. Fearless Leader Let's dive deeper into the extraordinary journey of Jerry Mad Dog Shriver. Get ready to learn about his time in the unique platoon known as the Hatchet Force. This squad was unlike any other, consisting of around three American soldiers and a hand-picked group of 25 to 30 Montagnards, fierce warriors who fought alongside the American troops. From the moment Shriver joined the Hatchet Force, he proved his unwavering dedication to the war effort. Not only did he eagerly partake in any mission that came his way, but he also went above and beyond to support his fellow soldiers both financially and with essential supplies. 
Shriver would spend every last penny, whether it be on weapons, food, or provisions, to ensure that his comrades and their families were taken care of. Shriver became so deeply embedded with the Montagnards that he would often reside in their barracks. He held them in the highest regard, and they reciprocated that respect. These native Vietnamese Highlanders were masters of scouting and reconnaissance, invaluable assets to the team. Together, they formed an unstoppable force. Shriver fearlessly led his platoon into intense firefights, refusing to retreat until every single man had been safely rescued. There's one incident that stands out among the rest. Picture this, his platoon was completely surrounded by relentless NVA soldiers. Now, most people would panic in such a situation, but not Shriver. In a legendary radio transmission to his base, he calmly declared, No, no, I've got him right where I want him, surrounded from the inside. When it came to weaponry, Shriver had his preferences. He was known for wielding short-barreled shotguns and submachine guns, but he had a stubborn aversion to using long rifles like the M16. He had his own unique style and he stuck to it. Even when given a break and told to stay put, Shriver couldn't resist the call of duty. He would sneak off to other bases or camps to join additional missions. There was one instance where he asked his superiors for some downtime, only to find himself fighting alongside the Play Jereng Special Forces team for several weeks. In a battle that took place on August 10, 1967, Shriver and his team infiltrated enemy bases, called in airstrikes, and engaged in a relentless firefight against waves of NVA forces. This man was unstoppable. Jerry Mad Dog Shriver's heart beat with a deep love and respect for his men, the Montagnards. These fiercely independent tribes of people hailed from the Vietnamese highlands and possessed an unwavering spirit, unmatched bravery on the battlefield, and seemingly supernatural tracking abilities. They were the epitome of jungle scouts and reconnaissance soldiers, unparalleled in their skills. Shriver's bond with the Montagnards ran deep. He held them in the highest regard, and they, in turn, revered him. Money meant little to Shriver, except when it came to the essentials and providing for his men and their families. Almost all the earnings he accumulated during his deployments went straight back to his Montagnards. He would collect food, clothing, and other donations from fellow soldiers to distribute to the villages of the Montagnards, who fearlessly supported him in his endeavors. While Shriver had American friends, he spent the majority of his time immersed in the Montagnard culture. He was the lone American residing in the Montagnard barracks at CCS, Command and Control South, sharing meals and partaking in the communal pot of Ru Khan, a type of alcoholic fermented wine, became a regular part of Shriver's routine. His dedication to the Montagnards went beyond the battlefield. Shriver embraced their way of life, their customs, and their camaraderie. The bond forged between him and the Montagnards was unbreakable, built on mutual respect and a shared commitment to their cause. First and Second Tours on October 23, 1967, Shriver led a recon team into Cambodia and discovered an abandoned enemy camp. While attempting to apprehend a prisoner, the platoon was discovered by a small, hostile force. Shriver initiated contact by firing his weapon, and a fierce firefight ensued. Despite being surrounded and outnumbered by an enemy platoon, Shriver remained calm and coordinated support from forward air controllers or FACs who called in the Air Force gunships. Shriver directed the air support, with rockets and minigun rounds striking the enemy at close range. Eventually, the enemy retreated, and Shriver's quick thinking and leadership played a crucial role in repelling the attack. Throughout 1967, Shriver and his platoon undertook numerous missions deep within NVA territory in Cambodia's Fishhook area. They frequently encountered enemy forces and employed covert tactics to escape. Shriver's bravery and tactical acumen were evident during these operations. On May 13, 1968, Shriver participated in a reconnaissance and ambush patrol alongside CPT Walter A. Hess. When Hess was wounded, Shriver took command of the patrol and exposed himself to hostile fire to organize a defensive perimeter. His actions resulted in heavy enemy casualties and minimized losses for his side. Third Tour From January to May 1968, Shriver continued conducting operations in Vietnam. However, he took a mandatory leave during the summer and returned to the United States. While there, he spent time with fellow Green Beret Larry White and purchased weapons, including a lever-action rifle that used a .444 Marlin cartridge. Shriver then sent these weapons back to his base for future use. Upon his return to Vietnam, Shriver participated in a B-50 Omega recon team mission on November 4, 1968. The team encountered a formidable enemy force, believed to be the size of a battalion. 
Leading his squad of three soldiers, Shriver initiated a heavy fire attack on the enemy, resulting in enemy casualties. During the engagement, Shriver skillfully guided gunship aircraft fire while providing cover for his radio operator and establishing communication with the gunships. The situation became even more intense when a Bell UH-1 helicopter that was attempting to land and retrieve the team came under machine gun fire. Shriver swiftly directed his soldiers to a different landing zone while continuously coordinating gunship strikes against the attackers. When the squad reached the new landing zone, rope ladders were dropped from the aircraft for extraction. Shriver demonstrated exceptional bravery by physically shielding his squad members from hostile fire as they boarded the helicopter. To expedite the extraction, Shriver used a snap link to attach himself to the ladder after ensuring all team members were on board. Even while hanging from the ladder, he continued to engage the enemy, exposing himself to enemy fire until the aircraft cleared the danger zone. These accounts highlight Shriver's unwavering courage, leadership, and determination in the face of intense combat situations. His actions during this mission exemplify his commitment to the safety and well-being of his fellow soldiers, as well as his ability to make split-second decisions under fire. Hero of the Vietnam War Jerry Mad Dog Shriver was a walking arsenal, an embodiment of firepower. His person was adorned with multiple pistols, and during missions, he was seldom seen without his trusty sawed-off shotgun, suppressed M3 grease gun, or Thompson submachine gun. Satchels of hand grenades and other explosives completed his formidable arsenal. When asked whether he preferred a Car 15 or an M16, Shriver dismissively replied, No sir, their long guns will get you in trouble. And besides, if I need more than these, I got troubles anyhow. In 1966, Shriver embarked on his deployment, which would stretch for almost three and a half years. His commitment to the cause was unwavering, and he kept extending his stay, accumulating over 1,000 years' days in the unforgiving terrain of Vietnam. It seemed as though he had forgotten how to switch off, becoming the embodiment of perpetual war. Instead of debriefing and seeking relaxation after completing a mission, Shriver would clandestinely slip away, joining another team for yet another patrol. On one occasion, he took leave to supposedly enjoy some rest and recuperation, but instead, he quietly made his way to the Plagerang Special Forces Camp, where he aligned himself with another Special Forces team, fighting alongside them for a couple of weeks. In 1960, Shriver was compelled to return to the United States for a mandatory period of rest and recuperation. During this time, his comrade, Green Beret Larry White, accompanied him. White revealed that Shriver sought out a Marlin Lever action rifle chambered in the powerful .444 Marlin cartridge. To put it into perspective, a .444 Marlin propels a 240-grain .44 projectile downrange at approximately 2,400 feet per second. A .44 Magnum revolver, by comparison, typically launches a 240-grain bullet at around 1,200 feet per second. At a distance of 200 yards, the impact of a .444 Marlin is more devastating than that of a 4-inch .44 Magnum fired at point-blank range. To illustrate the sheer power, people use .444 Marlin to hunt grizzly and polar bears. Shriver had his point, .444. Marlin shipped back to Military Assistance Command, Vietnam Studies and Observations Group, MACV SOG, headquarters, humorously remarking that he used it to bust bunkers, relishing the fear-inducing exit wounds it produced in his enemies. Despite his unyielding exterior, Shriver was not immune to the toll of war. Three long years of continuous combat had taken their toll on him. He had encountered death too many times, and each day he ventured out was a flirtation with the Grim Reaper. However, a deep sense of responsibility to his men prevented him from simply quitting. He confided in his close friends, expressing his fear of death and the belief that his luck had run out. Quitting wasn't in his nature. It wasn't how he was wired. This relentless warrior, this legendary soldier, this revered leader, Shriver was a warrior to the core. His fundamental philosophy was to fight, and it had brought him to the jungles of Vietnam and would accompany him to whatever fate, be it kind or cruel, awaited him. In its own poignant way, it was heartbreakingly sad. 
Shriver would remain true to himself until death ultimately claimed him. On the morning of April 24, 1969, the Sog Raider Company assembled beside the Quan Loi Airfield in South Vietnam, a mere 20 miles from the covert haven of the Central Office of South Vietnam, COSVN. This elusive North Vietnamese political and military headquarters within South Vietnam took shape in various villages, rendering it an ephemeral target. Due to the mission's secretive nature, Shriver's unit was denied most of its aerial assets by the U.S. State Department. Just before boarding his chopper, Shriver turned to his friend, bidding him to take care of my boy, referring to Klaus. With that, the SOG Raider unit took flight, although the first helicopter was soon forced to turn back due to mechanical issues, leaving Shriver's first and second platoons to continue alone. As their boots touched the ground, an onslaught of merciless machine gun fire assaulted them. Overlapping fields of fire from heavily fortified concrete bunkers raked across the landing zone. From the rear of the landing zone, Mad Dog Shriver transmitted over the radio, informing his comrades that his men were pinned down by a machine gun bunker to his left front. He sought anyone who could suppress the enemy fire and alleviate the pressure. Taking refuge in a crater, Captain Cahill, First Lieutenant Markantel, and a medic named Sergeant Ernest Jameson radioed back, reporting that they too were under relentless fire. Tragically, Jameson dashed out to retrieve a wounded comrade, only to be targeted by the machine gun's deadly hail and slain. None else was capable of engaging the machine gun that had trapped the SOSVN raiders. The responsibility fell upon Mad Dog Shriver and his Montagnards. Determined and resolute, Shriver announced over the radio that he would attempt to flank the enemy's machine gun positions. His half-smirk instilled unwavering resolve in his fighting Montagnards, and together they rose to their feet, charging forward. Shriver, once again embodying his old self, shed his fear, replacing it with unyielding confidence. He fearlessly advanced toward the enemy's gunfire, accompanied by five hand-picked mountain men who ran alongside him, defying the flying bullets as they dashed through the tree line and into the very heart of the Coesvian's lair. Missing in action. At the other end of the landing zone, things were getting pretty wild. This sergeant dude, Jameson, was lying there, not too far from where Captain Cahill and 1LT Markantel were hiding from a total onslaught of machine gun fire. That was really a very fierce and intense battle. Now Cahill decides to take a peek in what happens. Out of the blue, a bullet smacks him right in the mouth, goes all crazy, blinds his right eye, knocks him out cold, and leaves him bleeding like a stuck pig. Meanwhile, in a nearby crater, Lieutenant Greg Harrigan from the 2nd Platoon raised his eyebrows for the North Vietnamese Army. Rockets and miniguns were raining down like crazy, but Harrigan reports that more than half of his platoon got hit. For a crazy 45 minutes, this Green Beret lieutenant, Harrigan shouted the enemy should back off. He kept calling in accurate gun runs and held them at bay. But you know what? Fate's a real meanie, and even Harrigan couldn't escape those bullets forever. Rest in peace, brave soul. Time dragged on, wounded guys lying there, bleeding out in the scorching sun. Those poor Hueys tried to swoop in and save the day, but every time they tried to the emergency evacuation of the wounded, BAM! Heavy fire sent them running. But then, out of nowhere, a chill Australian twin jet bomber from No. 2 Squadron at Fan Rang heard the Raider Company's desperate pleas for help. By that point, only one Markantel was left, still directing calls for close air support. So close, in fact, that he ended up hurting himself and the remaining nine Montagnards. Now that's what we call dedication, even if it's a bit too close for comfort. Finally, after a grueling eight hours of non-stop battle, three Hueys zoomed in like superheroes. But the outcome wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. Out of the 18 members of the Hatchet Platoon, two were confirmed dead, ten were wounded, and six, including Shriver, were MIA. That's a tough pill to swallow. A week later, the U.S. Army and the Army of the Republic of Vietnam launched a major attack on the Central Office for South Vietnam CoSVN location. They found a massive logistics base with bunkers upon bunkers filled with weapons, food, and enough ammo and explosives to make your head spin. But guess what? The sneaky C2 node of the SOSVN vanished into thin air. In the following weeks, Radio Hanoi kept spouting off about how they captured and killed Shriver. But you know what? They never showed any proof. At one point, they offered a substantial bounty of $10,000 for his capture. By the end of 1967, 
it was reported that he had a kill count of over 100 enemy soldiers. Fast forward, a year after the Central Office for South Vietnam raid and the NSA intercepts enemy messages. Turns out, there was a mole within the Studies and Observation Group SOG headquarters. Yep, those crafty North Vietnamese managed to infiltrate Studies and Observation Group and had a spy wreaking havoc. That traitor caused the deaths of countless Americans, including the brave CoSVN Raiders. Now, Shriver was so close to finishing his third tour of duty, just three weeks away. He was a young buck, only 27 years old, when he got officially listed as MIA, which means missing in action. He left behind his buddy Klaus, a measly dollar in his account, and his beloved smoking jacket, which became some kind of holy relic at the camp's club. The inscription beneath it read, In memory of Sergeant First Class Jerry M. Shriver. In 1974, the big shots in charge, including the Secretary of the Army, made it official. They gave Shriver a fancy schmancy title called Presumptive Finding of Death. Basically, they closed his file for good, even though they never found his body. But hey, they didn't forget about Shriver's awesomeness. Oh no, they posthumously awarded him a second silver star and even promoted him to Master Sergeant. That's some serious recognition right there. Now here's where things get really interesting. Among the SOG veterans and Shriver's trusty Montagnards, there's a crazy myth that keeps floating around. They believe, with all their hearts, that one of these days, Mad Dog Shriver is gonna stroll out of the jungle, just like he's done a hundred times before. And what does he do? Accolades. Jerry Mad Dog. Shriver's exceptional bravery and skill were indeed recognized through various accolades, including the posthumous award of a second silver star and promotion to Master Sergeant. However, it is important to note that Shriver himself placed little importance on medals and awards. While he had an impressive collection of honors, including the Soldier's Medal for Heroism, Bronze Star with Oak Leaf Clusters, Air Medal, Army Commendation Medal with Valor Device, Purple Heart with Oak Leaf Clusters, and Combat Infantryman's Badge, Shriver's focus was not on external recognition. For Shriver, being a true warrior meant being driven by something far greater than the pursuit of medals or personal glory. His actions and dedication to his fellow soldiers were fueled by a deep sense of duty and a commitment to protecting and saving lives. The unwavering courage he displayed in combat went beyond the trappings of formal recognition. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.